Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I am Jessica Holting, the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, Board of Directors, staff and volunteers, I am honored to welcome each of you to today's program. As an institution grounded in the history and lessons of the Holocaust that work to share universal lessons of humanity, generate awareness and action against injustices worldwide, it is a pleasure to share this commemorative program with you, remembering the Holodomor, commemorating the famine, genocide in Ukraine. For over a decade, we've used special exhibitions, public and educational programming to engage our audiences through stories that connect us as humans. Stories that help us teach, learn, and inspire, as well as stories that help us look inward and grapple with the diff difficult narratives of the past including genocide and crimes against humanity. Through our exhibitions and programming, we want to create a forum for dialogue with our visitors that speaks to the legacies of such histories, to see how we see each other and the challenges of inequity and injustice still facing us today. In 1932, 1933, millions of Ukrainians starved to death in a man-made famine deliberately engineered by the Stalinist regime leaders. Known as Holodomor, the Ukrainian term for killing by starvation, the famine is one of the least known yet most horrendous genocides of the 20th century. This commemoration is in partnership with the Kiev Mohila Foundation of America. I would like to take a moment to thank our wonderful community partners who are listed on the slide in the beginning. We are honored to have many vital community leaders who will be speaking with us today during this program including Paul Grud, President of Ukrainian World Congress, Marta Ferion, President of the Kiev Mohila Foundation, Andrea Chalupa, screenwriter for the 2019 film, Mr. Jones, which chronicles a British investigative journalist as he breaks the news to Western media in the early 1930s. And we have Michael Sauku Jr., Chairman of the US Holodomor Committee. Without further ado, we welcome Paul Grud. Ladies and gentlemen, each year when we gather to commemorate the terrible tragedy of the Holodomor, I often ask myself, why? Why did Stalin and his henchmen commit such evil against the Ukrainian people? And why is this relevant to us today? Unfortunately, the Holodomor has as much relevance today to Ukrainians in the world as it did in 1932. Recently, Pulitzer Prize recipient Anna Applebaum illustrated how Soviet leader Joseph Stalin saw in Ukraine an existential threat as Putin sees in Ukraine today. Stalin launched his assault on Ukraine because he knew that Ukraine was resistant to centralized rule and Ukrainians were attached to the land and their traditions and that Ukrainians could challenge Bolshevism and even cause it to collapse. Today, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, fears the attachment of Ukrainians to their values of freedom, democracy, and human dignity. In fact, Putin's regime as did Stalin's, cynically denies the very existence of a distinct Ukrainian people. As Anne Applebaum said in a, her recent lecture, and I quote, if Stalin feared the Ukra that Ukrainian nationalism could bring down the Soviet regime, Putin fears that Ukraine's example can bring down his own regime, a modern autocratic kleptocracy. The Ukrainian community has done excellent work to educate the world about the Holodomor. We will hear today about the award-winning film, Mr. Jones, which was made possible thanks to the leadership and vision of Ms. Andrea Kolupa, Ms. Leah Lord Temerty, and the Temerty Family Foundation, which also funds the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, a remarkable initiative, which explores the hundreds of years of shared history and culture between Ukrainians and Jews. On behalf of the Ukrainian World Congress, which represents the interests of over 20 million Ukrainians in over 65 countries around the world, I want to thank the organizers of this virtual Holodomor commemoration event, the Illinois Holocaust Museum, 
and the Cave Mohilla Foundation of America. I also want to thank all of you and the thousands of other individuals and communities around the world who continue to commemorate and educate the world about the Holodomor. Together, we must stand up to modern day tyrants that execute, terrorize, and poison their opponents, both at home and abroad. We call on all Americans and all peace-loving people around the world. Stand up to today's dictators and war criminals like Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and Vladimir Putin that commit genocides and other crimes against humanity. May God inspire us to do good and may the memory of the victims of, of the Holodomor be eternal. Bichna im pamet. Thank you, Paul, for your remarks. We will now view together witness testimony. To stěhnul jsem máme spěchaj chustku z něle čobote, a my byli vši, my nikdo v nás čobit nemal, bosi byli my. To máma moja duže plakala, káže, co já budu robit, já nepídu ni drův neprenesu ni co na dítě, káže, vydochnit kurku lenyata. I ohrabili nás tak usilí, že pozabírali vše v chatě, co bylo. My měli taky kazany, co máma varila svinjem jíste, to ty kazany pozabírali, porozbívali. Корову у нас була на подвір'ї одна, забрали корову, і телятко забрали, щоб корови не було. Позабирали все чисто. Збудував хату і збудував одну стіну, таку товщу, знаєте, така широка була. А вони прийшли, вони так думали, що він будував хату, але прийшли і подивилися, що він тут робить. А він зробив дві стіні, а це порожнеча, порожнеча, знаєте, була у середині. Він там насипав, він там насипав ріжного кукургузу, скидав і пшениця, що тільки мав, може, в мішках і так. Він там накидав. А прийшли до нього, обдивилися скрізь, поміряли, що стіна широка. Чому стіна широка? Питаються його, він каже, що він не знає, так зробив. А вони почали крутити сверлами, почало сипатися із середини. Так його завезли на Сибір, цілу родину. All the food that they have confiscated from the people by force, was stored in the storages on the other side of the village. The people knew that there was food there, and quite often, especially mothers will, with the small children that didn't attend the school, were approaching, we used to call them burte, uh, this, uh, uh, Storage. storages. But they were beaten up, they were shot while they were begging for some food. I only know how my mom and dad came back, how they cried. But at that time, when they came, my two sisters died. Я знаю, що вони померли, але де вони померли, чи вони в хаті померли, чи вони десь на дорозі, я не знаю. Не знаю, де, а я тільки знаю, що вони померли там. Я знаю, як тато помер, що як його ховали, але не знаю, бо тато вже навесні помер, він дістав запалення, то він помер. Померли вони, моєї мами сестра, її чоловік і троє середущих дітей померли, сусіди наші. Вся сім'я вимерла, тільки сови в берг, бо знаєте, наші старенькі хати великі були, тільки сови літали, то й верх кричали. 
Другі сусіди, вони мали троє дітей, то одна тільки дівчина лишилася, померли з холоду. І там, я пригадую, дуже добре ходили діти. Я думаю, що вони були і, можливо, сільського, а може і міського походження. Вони ходили, жебрали, і вони співали. Я цю пісеньку пригадую. І ця пісенька співалася «Ой, умру я, умру я, поховають мене, і ніхто не буде знати, де могила моя, і ніхто не, зап... і, і ніхто не згадає, ну, і ніхто не прийде, і ніхто не згада, тільки ранньою весною Соловей заспіва». Вони ходили між людей, і просили собі. I would now like to introduce Marta Ferian, president of the Kiev Mohila Foundation, the co-sponsor of this program. There will be a Q&A opportunity at the end of their discussion. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Marta. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jessica, I um, thank you very much for your kind words, and I wish to thank the Illinois Holocaust Museum for hosting this event and everyone who made this program possible, including my good friend Steve Robinson. After reading the book Red Famine by Anne Applebaum, Steve was so shocked about the lack of knowledge about Stalin's genocide in Ukraine that he called me and said, Marta, we've got to do something about this. And he did. It was Steve who brought me together with the Holocaust Museum. And I want to thank him publicly for his initiative. So thank you, Steve, and we miss you in Chicago. The word Holodomor, as you've heard, comes from two Ukrainian words, meaning Holod, which means hunger, and Mor, which means death. Actually, it's from the Latin, it's Morte, it means death. The word genocide comes from Greek and Latin, meaning killing and tribe or clan. But we can't talk about the Holodomor and genocide without mentioning Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jewish lawyer who in the 1920s studied law in the city of Lviv or Lvov as it was called in Polish. And Lemkin lost his entire family in the, in the Holocaust, except for his brother. But ultimately he escaped to New York and brought his brother over in a few years. He coined the word genocide in the 1940s, actually in the late 30s. And he dedicated his life to establish the legal concept of genocide, which in 1948 was adopted by the United Nations. The legal recognition of this crime is important, but for me, this was always about the victims because these were actual human beings with families and unborn children. And now I am thrilled to introduce our special guest today, Andrea Chalupa. Andrea studied history and Soviet studies at the University of California at Davis. And, she's, and she also studied Ukrainian at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Her articles were published in many, many publications. And her film has been shown 
in major film festivals in the world. She is the author of the book Orwell and the Refugees, The Untold Story of Animal Farm. She's the screenwriter of the film Mr. Jones, a film that received excellent reviews by all major publications. But first, let us see a segment of the movie and we'll have Andrea tell us a bit more about this segment. Five. Moscow 71795. Центральная телефонная станция Москвы. Слушаю вас. Алло, гостиница Метрополь. Мистер Клэп. Я телефон, пожалуйста. Окей, извини. Спасибо. Алло. This is Gareth Jones in London. Uh, listen, I'm on my way to Moscow. Gareth, I've been trying to reach you. So we're coming here. Paul, I need your help again, this time arranging an interview with Stalin. Please tell me you know a way. Go see Walter Duranti at the New York Times. He has influence. I'm persona non grata at the moment. Listen, I really need to talk to you. I found something big. You can break this story wide open. It's worse than we thought before. Paul? Paul? Алло. Э, не работает. Andrea? Hello. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. As our time is limited, I, I will ask you now to give us some context to the scene we just saw. Beautifully acted, by the way. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone for being here and thank you to all the organizers, the Holocaust Museum, all the people mentioned so far. It really takes a village to bring healing and awareness of, of uh, these overlooked genocides and the urgent lessons they have for us today. Um, so the scene we just saw, uh, played beautifully by James Norton, is our young Mr. Jones, very ambitious, trying to uh, find his footing after having just lost his job in Great Depression, London. And he is chasing down these rumors of, of something big happening in the Soviet Union. And this is pretty close to what was happening at the time for the real life Gareth Jones, who um, had just lost, who didn't have his contract renewed with his boss, uh, the former World War I Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Gareth Jones was a very ambitious man, a, a rising star. He had just talked his way onto an airplane with the new chancellor of Germany, Adolf Hitler, and made headlines for that. And so his next big target was Stalin's so growing massively uh, modernizing Soviet empire. And Gareth goes there uh, in March. And ironically, when Gareth, the real life Gareth arrives in Ukraine to uh, do the big investigation that would launch his destiny and, and, and his legacy, that happened to be when we first began filming his story in Ukraine. So it was really odd to just be there uh, with those anniversaries adding up. Um, and so what we see is a, a phone call, again, based on a real life character, a German reporter by the name of Paul Schaeffer, who in real life tipped off Gareth to what was going on. And Sheffer gets expelled from the Soviet Union. And I believe if I recall it, he turns down a really big job with Time Magazine in London and instead goes to Berlin to fight Hitler and stays as long as he can in Berlin for the Berliner Tagoblatt, which was an independent newspaper that eventually gets shut down by the Nazis. This man was Gareth's mentor at the time. He was one of the few 
uh, respected names in media that had Garrick's back and and, and tried to uh, you know back him up with his reporting on his explosive reporting that Stalin, the great um, socialist hero, the utopia maker of the workers' paradise, was actually a mass murderer. And um, and so what we see in that scene is is like a is. Is, I love that scene so much, and it's beautifully shot by the great Agnieszka Holland because there's so many kernels of, of actual history in that. So I'm honored to pay tribute to those extraordinarily brave men. And what we see in the background is this glittery uh, Metropole Hotel, which was the gilded cage that the foreign correspondents and the and the glittery expat literati of Moscow, Westerners, people that flocked from all over the world, excited by this great socialist experiment. And what they, what, what they, many of them were aware of was that the Soviet experiment was failing and that it was creating a flood of refugees from Ukraine and other parts um, like Kazakhstan to the big cities. People were starving. People were begging on the streets for bread. One big shot American reporter who is featured in the film, Eugene Lyons, describes a woman coming up trying to give her wedding ring to him in exchange for some bread. Um, people were being slowly starved to death. And out of this, the many genocides, that because St Stalin committed several genocides, out of the many genocides that Stalin committed, uh, this is considered arguably his worst uh, crime against humanity. Andrea, this is uh, absolutely um, history that needed to be told. So I... Um wanted to ask you about your connection to the Holodomor because uh, I know that your uh, family or your ancestors come from the Poltava region and maybe you can give us a foreword to the next uh, selection of the film that we're going to see and tell us about your family background and and also tell us a little bit about how impressive um, these scenes are in the snow and in the winter uh, and where this was filmed. Yeah, so I uh, got the idea to make Mr. Jones to write it to, and eventually I had no choice but to produce it because <laughs> no one is very tough to get uh, the support for a, a little known genocide. Um, so I was inspired to do this by my beloved grandfather, my, my Didlonia, who is from Donbass, which is a part of uh, Eastern Ukraine that is currently under a uh, Russian occupation or Russian invasion. And my grandfather um, was the world to me. I, he was just my son and I, and I um, to honor him, you know, given what he had lived through under Stalin, um, I decided to go on this mad quest <laughs> to make this film. And I was very, very, very lucky. And I, I recommend everybody listening to do this for the people you love in your family because it will be a treasure beyond what you know. Um, my grandfather took time to sit down and write his life story. He was not a writer. He was not a writer, but he, he paints, he did it. And, um, he, and, I, and I was able to get those pages and, and have them translated from Ukrainian into English while living in Ukraine after college. And I was struck by how my grandfather described being a little boy watching the Tsar's army be pulverized by barefoot and tattered Bolsheviks, the Russian Revolution, and then uh, being a, a young man barely surviving Stalin's genocide famine in Ukraine, and then being arrested as a young father during Stalin's purges and being tortured in prison. And what I saw was the eyes of, of Orwell's animal farm through an individual who had survived it. And um, for me, that's also why Orwell gets woven into the, the story of the film of Mr. Jones. And uh, when we were filming uh, Ukraine, we started off with Ukraine. We put our very posh, uh, extraordinary English actors, James Norton and Vanessa Kirby into this um, snowy hellscape. It was just a massive snows that winter. And we began uh, filming about an hour outside Kiev in a very rural area. And an old, an old woman came out from her house in the middle of this village, it, it just deck expects on the snow of, of houses. And she told our crew that she had survived the famine, that she was a survivor. And so she stood there and like watched the filming of, of this Western, you know, Western actors, Western crew telling her story, a story that had been hidden from the world for generations. And um, I, I, the, the clip that you're gonna show now um, is, 
comes directly from my grandfather's memoir. This is what he witnessed, what we're about to see. Um, it's an extraordinary scene. Um, when, when we were filming it, as I mentioned, it was, it was a horrific snowstorm. We had a crew member that had to go to the hospital because it was so freezing and people were barely sleeping because we were just fighting through. And to, to, to sort of help people, you know, sort of build morale, I sent out to everybody, the cast and crew and James Norton, I sent them an excerpt of my grandfather's memoir, how he described witnessing what we're about to see and, and what was written in the script and how they're nearly identical. And, and that's what everybody got. And then they filled, they filmed the scene and there was this moment in the air when, when all of that was filming, that, that reminder of, of what we were fighting for and why we were there. So I don't know if you wanna play the clip now, Marta, or Andrew. This, this scene is overwhelming. It's unbelievable. And I have to admit that uh, descriptions of such scenes were told to us by many, many others. So this is not made up. This is actually what happened, including obviously throwing, you know, people who were still alive into these carts and also we know what happened during world war ii so my question to you is how do we describe the fact that these decisions were so political that politics and the power of governments were behind the decisions of killing so many people and how the politics influences these horrors and these genocides and they seem to repeat themselves all through the 20th century so um how do we deal with this as human beings and how do we deal with the other interesting fact that the fact that nobody knew in the world except for a few individuals and that even the new york times was publishing information that there was no famine at the time knowing full well what was really going on and the power of soviet disinformation and false information which we still have today in our time maybe you yeah, the, can comment about that a little bit and duranti and the role that he played with the new york times those are excellent questions. I think human beings have to become masters of prevention because um, when you allow economic crashes to happen, if, if you don't stop the conditions that create economic crashes, if you work really hard as a global alliance to prevent wars from breaking out, um, it becomes a lot easier to strengthen the rule of law worldwide and to follow those rules and and essentially contain dictators and wannabe dictators. What we were dealing with in 1933 was the fallout of the, of the global Great Depression. And um, on top of that, you had a lot of enduring trauma of, of the Great War. And people just 
the British establishment of the day just did not want to be bothered. And, and neither did, the, did FDR and the Americans. And so it was a lot easier for them to turn a blind eye to what Stalin was doing to their own people. They knew, they knew. It, it, was, it was more that uh, Durante and the fancy leading uh, journalists of the day um, did their part in uh, protecting their own careers, protecting their access to the Kremlin and furthering their careers and reputations of these voices, these translators of what was really happening in, inside uh, Stalin's empire. And by those journalists, those, those essentially co-opted propagandists saving themselves, they gave an out to the British establishment and the American establishment to turn a blind eye and in turn make blood money joining the Soviets in sending over their own companies, their own business leaders to help Stalin rapidly modernize his regime. And so, um, and, and one could argue that like, in their minds, they felt justified. They were exhausted by the Great Depression. They were exhausted by, they didn't, they didn't, no one wanted to go to war again over this. So in their minds, they, they justified it as their hands were tied. And as Stalin would famous, or no, sorry, Durante, for <laughs> Freudian slip on that. But as Durante would famously say, as we show in the film, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. And so I think it was just, um, in their mind, all these millions were just a sacrifice to, to just keep going with, with this status quo and, and we can eventually get somewhere with Stalin and, and use him to help defeat Hitler. Because they had an eye on that as well. There was, there was um, Obviously, Hitler was um, rising at this time as well. So they were sort of picking their battles. That was the mindset. It, of course, does not make it acceptable because um, with Stalin getting away with this and um, um, he went on to commit more atrocities. And, and it also gave a green light to Hitler who, um, you know, as we start the film, Hitler just comes to power. What does Hitler do within six months of being in power? He destroys democracy in Germany and he builds his first concentration camp. He, the, the, they start the Holocaust. And, um, and so Hitler had saw that Stalin got away with mass murder. So why wouldn't he do the same? And um, so it, it's this horrible like lack of accountability that gives a green light for this corruption and mass murder to, to, uh, to lack of a better word, continue on and flourish and just spread essentially. And, um, and what this also does is it leaves enduring trauma to uh, the impacted regions, to the people, to their families. One thing I kept hearing was that um, the descendants of survivors, they didn't talk about it in their family. They were too terrified to talk about it. And that's quite a common uh, trauma that gets passed down from generations. And it's, it's not unique to Ukrainians. You have it with... Um, uh, black families in America that survived the, the massacre of Black Wall Street in Oklahoma. They, that, that terror lived inside of them and, and they didn't talk about it. They were too scared. I, I, I saw that um, as well in that reporting and on that, on that little known history in America. And, um, and I worry today about the, um, the psyches of countries and groups of people that suffer that, where, where there's a trauma in their own history and they're not allowed to talk about it. Because as we know, if you bring these atrocities to the surface, if you shine light on them, that's how you can begin to heal. That's how you can be begin to learn from them. And I have a lot of, um, a lot of this film, obviously it was made to honor the victims, to bring it into light, uh, to give voice to the voiceless. It was, it was its own form of justice and healing. And, and um, that itself is, is, is a really powerful defiance that the world needs more of today. At the same time, this, I, this film was also made in the spirit for the Russian people who right now are being oppressed by Putin. The potential of Russia today is, is in prison by Putin and his, his, his corruption. And um, Stalin is enjoying a, um, um, a, a renaissance of, of being seen as, as widely across Russia as this great hero, even though he mass murdered some of the best and brightest of, of, of Russian society. And one of the most heartbreaking conversations I had on my journey of making Mr. Jones was a conversation with a group of Russian expats living in Warsaw who said to me, how do we as Russians honor our history? Could you tell us as a Ukrainian, like you Ukrainians have, you know, do it quite well with the famine. So how do we talk about our own history? Show us, tell us. Because they didn't, they felt, they felt like they had no institutional support inside Russia, that this is such a taboo subject. You have um, a, a Russian historian 
being sent to prison on, an, on trumped up charges because of investigating Stalin's terror. And so of course, and that just furthers the trauma and furthers the terror. And, and it makes it, I believe, difficult for, for people to move forward if, if they have this, this, this unhealed, unaddressed trauma. And, and it's certainly an issue, of course, of accountability as well. I really identify with what you're saying about uh, generations, uh, the survivors and their children and the next generations unwilling to speak about what they witnessed. And that, uh, that silence that kept them uh, from uh, for, for forcing them to, uh, to analyze and to understand what really happened. And also the fact that the older generations did not want to transfer that trauma onto their children and grandchildren. In my own family and the families of many, many Ukrainians, we had the same issues where we didn't really know what happened and what our parents went through during the war. And I certainly know that survivors of the Holocaust also did not want to talk about what they went through and their own children did not know what really happened and tried to figure out some of the behavioral patterns of their parents. It's only after the children become adults and they start looking into the history and doing research that all of this comes out. And of course, as you mentioned, this manipulation of information and uh, planting fake information or disinformation is something that even in our own days, we need to be very aware of. Of course, the technology and the social media uh, are, are helping to, uh, to, to spread false information. So education here really becomes very, a very important factor. But I, have, uh, I, I know we're going to have a few questions from the audience. I have one more question that I always wondered about. How long did it take you to do all the research? You must have been researching the history and all the details for quite a long time before you uh, came up with the script. Yeah, I lived with the research for an extremely long time and, uh, and um, interviewing survivors, my grandfather's memoir, digging into George Orwell's own life and um, also Durante's so the whole story started with Walter Durante. It was this idea of why would a journalist go against the ethics of their profession? And, and I was fascinated by him. And when I read that he was a lover of the great Satanist Aleister Crawley and did all these opium and satanic sex orgies in 1920s Paris, that for a college kid was like catnip. And so I went down that rabbit hole initially and through the devil Durante, I eventually landed on my angel, Gareth Jones, and I got to know his niece, um, uh, uh, Cyril Coley. Like my grandfather was a world to me, Gareth was the world to her growing up. And she, working with her son, Nigel Coley, uh, were the, these masters of this period and, and the life and times of Gareth Jones that kept his legacy alive. and did a lot of events and press around him. And sadly, they both passed away before the film was made and, and they didn't get a chance to see it. But um, it was talking It was talking to all these, these brilliant minds um, to piece together this world. And I think the hardest part about a historical action adventure, historical drama, thriller, is that so much of the history it has to get um, simplified. And, um, but remarkably the beats, the, the historical beats of, of Gareth's real life story were, were quite true to what you see. Obviously we, we invent all the dialogue and we, when we, we inevitably spice things up. But what we ultimately want this film to do is be like a gateway drug to pull you into reading Ann Applebaum's Red Famine or reading Bloodlands by Tim Snyder on how Hitler and Stalin um, in, influenced each other and, and uh, you know, read the articles on the Atlantic and, and the New Republic about what really happened. And because the, the truth is always stranger than fiction. And that's and one reviewer that, that watched Mr. Jones said that Oddly enough, the strangest moments of Mr. Jones are the ones that are most factually accurate, and that's very true. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, for your work and for sharing with us all of these details that lie behind the making of the movie. I think, um, Jessica, that there are probably quite a few uh, questions. So can you please yeah. um, let us know? 
Well, first and foremost, I think people really want to know where to watch this film. Where can they find it? So go to Amazon, iTunes, or cable on demand, and um, you can watch it there. Uh, I recommend on the biggest screen you have, if you can, because there's some gorgeous Dr. Zhivago-like train sequences. <laughs> Great. Um, how a lot of people are wondering, how come people have never heard of this genocide? Because the Soviets are really good at confusing the truth. It wasn't, it's not enough to just deny that this didn't happen. They, they denied it, of course, but they also created a lot of confusion and debate. Well, was it a genocide? Did it really happen? Was it a natural event? Famines happen in nature. So it was the um, confusion, the muddling of the truth for many generations that kept it underground. And um, this is the first real mainstream film about it. And hopefully there's going to be a lot more that come. Great. What is the current estimate of how many people lost their lives in the Holodomor? So part of the crime is that um, obviously with the Holocaust, there was a thorough investigation by objective investigators. You had the Americans and, and all the interviews. And amazingly enough, um, when, the, when the allies were doing interviews with Holocaust survivors, they were talking to sort of, uh, women or people that um, had lived through both the famine and then later the Holocaust. And I, can't, I just can't imagine living through Stalin's genocide and then Hitler's genocide and surviving both. Um, and so when, when the investigators were hearing those interviews and hearing about a famine, they didn't understand. They didn't really know what the, the women were talking about. And that comes from Tim Snyder. Tim Snyder gives a lecture. You can find that in a lecture of his on, online. Um, and so the, the, the number of casualties we, do, we simply do not know because the Soviet Union existed for several decades after the crime. And so they're very good at containing the information. So by conservative estimates, it's something like uh, a little under 5 million. And the vast majority of that were Ukrainian. And then you had, um, I think, I believe, a, a, nearly a million, in, around a million in Kazakhstan because it, it, they, were, they were targeted as well. Um, Duranti himself said 10 million. Stalin, I believe, in Yalta told um, FDR it was around 10 million. So, so Stalin and Duranti were throwing around the number 10 million. Um, Gareth Jones, who, who said it was millions. Um, so, so that's part of the crime is we don't get to know the actual numbers yet. If I may uh, interject here, as I was reading about the life of uh, Raphael Lemkin, who investigated the Armenian genocide and the Ukrainian uh, genocide of the Holodomor, in, in 1943, he said that it was up to 10 million. Of course, it is very, very difficult to document. And there are always uh, arguments uh, based on uh, various documents uh, and how they are viewed. But the number is uh, horrendous. It is millions and millions of people who died. Yeah, it was it was it was torture. It was it, they, they, Anne Applebaum in her book describes what the body and the mind goes through driven mad by hunger. And um, Tim Snyder described orphans overrunning an orphanage and, and e even eating and killing like, a, a live child to, to survive. Like the, the mind goes ma mad with hunger. Like parents eating their own children. It was just, it's, it was, it's, it's, the film, Mr. Jones relies on the Hitchcock technique of showing the knife, not the stabbing. So we don't show the full horror just to, enough for, the, for you to fill in the rest. But if you study the history, it's, it's like a, horror film of what these people endured. So in your research, um, Gareth Jones kept detailed diaries. Is this, did you see these diaries? Do you know where they are archived? Yes, yeah, so there is, um, so Gareth Jones went to Aberystwyth, uh, the university in Wales, and there's a plaque to him there. And that's where his archives are. And, and thanks to uh, Nigel Coley, his great nephew, I was able to access the archives and, and hold Garrett's letters and his diaries. And what really struck me from that trip was how human he was. So I think for many years in my research, I turned him into a god in my mind. And then when I was reading the letters, he was writing his parents when he was in his, you know, mid to late 20s, just like I was at that time, telling his parents, 
get off my back. Stop, stop telling me to get a normal, stable job and settle down with Jane Evans. And I related to that so much because I was headed on this insane quest to make this movie. My parents were like, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, get off my back. <laughs> so at that, that moment for me, it, it, holding Gareth's letters, um, holding his diaries is, was when he finally became a human being to me. And, and I have Nigel Coley to thank for that. Great. So there is one question. Was there any discussions within the cast of Mr. Jones regarding the scene that involved cannibalism? Yeah, there was, oh gosh. Where okay, so I think um, I think James Norton was an exceptional Gareth Jones. Like there was no other person that could play Gareth but him. And what I mean by that is um, we had another actor who was supposed to do it and then had to pull out, which is very common. And James saved the day coming in last minute, and and it was this extraordinary intuitive process writing for James Norton. It was like he was born to play Gareth Jones and he zeroed in on the script every single rehearsal and elevated every every batch of script we shot and he was just like spiritually destined to play this role and, and he just took to that so well and became a leader on the set and, and, and helped keep people's spirits up during this tough time. So I he himself had issue with it like he thought it was an essential moment to show um the circles of Dante's Inferno that Gareth was going down and, and, and that scene is just um all of the sequence in Ukraine and I want people to know journey of getting this film produced going through all the many gatekeepers you have to go through a lot of people that really wanted to join the project and were throwing money at it wanted us to, to completely rewrite Ukraine and thanks to Agnieszka Holland for being the fearless Iron Lady of cinema, she refused to touch Ukraine. She fought for it. And that objectively from all the reviews of, has, is like the best part of the film. But we had a fight for that. And a lot of the gatekeepers were like, we don't get the Ukraine sequence. They do now. Well, Andrea, you, you've done so much with this film for the world to finally get to know more about this. And uh, I might as well add that uh, the Kremlin, even to this day, is uh, sending out disinformation and false information about this terrible tragedy that happened. And of course, we know that they like to rewrite history. So uh, I, I'm very thankful on behalf of all of us in our audience that you agreed to show uh, sequences from the movie, explain how it was all, how it came about, and um, to spread the word for everybody to really think about what they read and what they hear, because uh, history is always written by those who are in charge of politics. So thank you so much for I, I wanna, coming. I, 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 well, I want to thank you all because I really needed this with everything going on in the world. I needed to connect with like-minded people and, and to fight for human rights and, and fight to give a voice and, and to expose uh, the dangers of disinformation and propaganda where lives are literally at stake. Disinformation dehumanizes. All genocides begin with disinformation. And I want to tell all of the descendants of Holocaust survivors and the Holodomor listening that your family stories matter and that history is healing. And as painful as it might be to address and, and talk about those histories, it's so necessary. It's absolutely necessary. So do what you can to be defiant. Do what you can to leave an a record for, for your families, for those that come after you, because that is how we're ultimately going to prevent the, the, the next genocides. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. you certainly are a role model for many. Thank well, you. you are for me, Marta. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Jessica, for and, and thank you so much, Wendy and, and Andrew. I'm, I'm so grateful for your institution. And we're going to we're going to make sure that the, that the victims of the Holocaust are honored and that everyone knows the causes of the Holocaust. And, and I'm and I'm so my, my heart breaks when I read statistics about people's ignorance today, but we're going to combat that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Andrea. I would now like to introduce Michael Sauchu Jr., the chairman of the U.S. Holodomor Committee. 
Jessica, thank you. Uh, Marta and Andrea, thank you very much for um, your wonderful presentation and the discussion. It's hard to um, bat clean up after um, such a, a beautiful discussion, but I'd like to discuss at least a little bit to give you an overview of some of the projects of the U.S. Holodomor Committee. Um, I know that there are actually um, a few questions that have been um, asked already about several of the, um, excuse me, I'm trying to share my screen. I should yes. say that Michael gave me free therapy and a lot of seed money to get Mr. Jones <laughs> off the ground. So do what you can to support his work. <laughs> So just a little bit, we have already spoken much about Raphael Lemkin, who actually is the person who termed the coin, uh, coined the term um, genocide and is used today in the 1948 Genocides Convention. Um, and it, it's most interesting in terms of just the definition that Raphael Lemkin coined. Um, it is as follows. It is a coordinated strategy to destroy a group of people, a process, that can be accomplished through total annihilation, as well as strategies that eliminate key elements of the group's basic existence, including language, culture, and economic infrastructure. That is one of the basis of the awareness campaign that the U.S. Holdemore um, Committee has been doing for the past several decades. What you see in front of you is a memorial that was dedicated five years ago on November 7th of 2015. Interestingly enough, we used the date of November 7th as a very symbolic and ironic date because that was the start of the Russian Bolshevik Revolution. And obviously it is the Bolshevik Communist Revolution that brought about the famine and the genocide in Ukraine in 1932-33. This was attended by tens of thousands of people in Washington, D.C. Um, it was attended by the First Lady of Ukraine, um, various di um, uh, diplomats, as well as congressional leaders. We're very thankful to everyone's support. It is located in a very prominent place for those of you that know Washington, D.C., on the corner of North Capitol Street and Massachusetts Avenue, only blocks away from the United States Capitol. It's listed on Google Maps. It's a, a stop on the D.C. tour guide. Um, buses. So if there is an, ever an opportunity, I um, uh, welcome all of you to come and visit. Thousands of people in the past five years have already um, uh, perused by this particular memorial and looked at its significance. One of the main aspects of teaching about genocide is to make sure that genocide is recognized. The awareness campaign that we at the, UHO, at the U.S. Whole, uh, Whole of the World Committee have been doing is to make sure that states recognize Holodomor as genocide. We are fortunate that in the past several years, we've made a committed effort throughout all of the 50 states um, within the United States to promote this particular project. And so far we have accomplished 21 out of the 50 states with major US cities as well. And we are very fortunate that in 2018, both the United States Senate and the House of Representatives have acknowledged and have certified that the U.S. that the whole Demar was a, um, a genocide um, in 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 the definition as stated earlier. One of the key elements, however, is curriculum development. I noticed that this was a question that was asked by one of the participants, um, and I've this is a, an opportunity to examine how curriculum development um, is, is brought forth in the United States. Obviously, we have a very decentralized system in the United States for education. It is a state-by-state -state mandate, and even at times it is a school district-by-school -school district mandate. We have been fortunate in the term, in the past several months during this pandemic, to partner with organizations such as the National Council for the Social Studies, the Texas Council of the Social Studies, to produce webinars about Holodomor and about the lesson plans that teachers can provide to teach their respective students. Again, um, as each state is, is um, uh, individual in its mandates, one of the particular challenges is to mandate legislatively genocide studies. This is as well for the Holodomor as it is for the Holocaust, as it is for any other um, genocide that has existed in the world as well. The mandate gives the opportunity for the teachers to actually present this material um, and to present it in a very 
a systematic way so that what we achieve are the understandings of how genocides happen and obviously to pre pre prevent them in the future. Our work and efforts continue not just within the United States, but as a global Ukrainian community, we, we um, uh, look for the recognition of the Holodomor as genocide throughout the world. There have been at least a dozen and a half, almost two dozen countries throughout the world that have already recognized the Ukrainian famine as, the, as a genocide. And we're working and we're striving to make sure that all 180 plus countries throughout the world also recognize the Holodomor as a genocide. Holodomor in the arts. This is obviously um, a very easy factor in terms of bringing forth knowledge about the Holodomor. As you've heard from uh, Andrea about Mr. Jones, prior to uh, Andrea's film of 2019 was Bitter Harvest of 2017, and also a documentary that we produced, which is called When You Starve, which talks about not so much the historical aspect about the Holodomor, but the psychological and the sociological aspects of what does it mean to starve? What does it mean to die of um, uh, starvation, to die of famine? It is most interesting and talks through, uh, uh, goes through a wide array of individuals um, from, from religious um, um, hierarchy, as well as to doctors to describe this particular um, event in, in Ukrainian history. As well, a, a, a issue that we have discussed and many times have been mentioned in the past hour is Walter Durante. As we all know, Walter Durante was a Moscow correspondent for the New York Times from 1922 to 1936. And he received the Pulitzer Prize in 1932 for his reporting about the Soviet Union. But it was most interesting that in 1931, in his interaction with the United States diplomat in uh, Berlin, called A.W. Clyforth, he had acknowledged that the New York Times coverage of the Soviet Union actually reflected the actual opinion and propaganda of the Soviet regime. He was quoted as even saying at the height of the famine that there is no famine or actual starvation, nor is there likely to be, unquote. So this is an opportunity that we see to um, uh, try to revoke the uh, New York Times uh, Walter Durante's Pulitzer Prize, as well as obviously to discuss about the, um, the, the sheer uh, relevance of the Holodomor and the genocide in the world today. We have partnered this particular month in a virtual uh, food drive with Feeding America. Generally, our communities, just like other communities throughout this Thanksgiving time, would contribute and would volunteer to, to give food, to give foodstuffs to food banks, um, to distribute to um, those less fortunate in this Thanksgiving period. This being the pandemic, we have partnered with um, feedingamerica.org to do a virtual food drive. And we're uh, requesting that donations be made of $19.33, a very symbolic um, uh, gesture. $19.33, obviously the year of the Holodomor and the heightened, uh, uh, the most uh, deaths that were uh, caused by the Holodomor being in that particular year. Ukraine remembers, the world acknowledges, the world will be commemorating the International Holodomor Remembrance Day on November 28th of 2020. We request that all of, uh, of you, those that are watching, your friends as well, to please light a candle and to remember the victims of the Ukrainian Holodomor. So um, that is a quick review um, of our work as the Ukrainian um, US Holodomor uh, Committee. I ask you in terms of your efforts in joining us to, um, to light a candle, to revoke Walter Durante's Pulitzer Prize, to mandate genocide studies within all states so that we all learn about the travesties of genocide and to prevent them from the future. I thank the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, and to everyone involved. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you so much to all of our speakers today. I was am amazing to learn so much and you know, just learning about denial and taking action against it. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today for this afternoon's powerful and meaningful commemoration. Please take a moment to fill out the survey in the chat 
this helps us to make sure our programs are, you know, amazing and allows for our generous donors to get more we can report back. Please join us for all our upcoming virtual programming. You will find a link to our events page in the chat. Our next virtual uh, lunch and learn is titled Pearl Harbor, the surprise military strike that led to the US, led the US to war. This is the last of our 2020 liberation series and will take place on Thursday, December 3rd at 12 p.m. Central. We look forward to seeing you again soon.